I'm Megan Carpenter, Dean of the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. Right now, there are many things that have changed, but one thing has not changed. Here at the law school, our program of legal education expands well beyond the classroom. In this vein, we're grateful for our partnership with the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, New Hampshire Humanities, and St. Anselm College. At UNH Franklin Pierce, we seek to engage in dialogue on the most pressing issues of the day. And we invite you to have a front row seat. And while in normal times, not everyone can always expect to literally have a front row seat, one bright spot during these times is that you can, from the comfort of your own home, wherever that is. Welcome. There are so many challenges that we face as a society and legal issues, the rule of law, the constitution itself sit at their core. We are so honored to have Judge Garland with us this evening and honored that you have joined us. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is John Gravy and I direct the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice Leadership and Public Service at the UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. The Rudman Center provides curricular, experiential, and financial support for law students who are interested in public service. Uh, the center also serves as a face of the university here in Concord by presenting public programming, such as tonight's event, that aligns with its mission. We are so pleased to partner with the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education to present another installment in the, w in the William W. Treat Lecture Series. This series is made possible through a generous grant from the William W. Treat Foundation. Judge Treat was a diplomat, banker, and New Hampshire probate court judge. He chaired the New Hampshire Judicial Council and authored a three-volume treatise on probate law. He also served as a public delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. Judge Treat believed deeply in the respectful exchange of ideas across party lines to advance the public good. Tonight is also part of the ongoing, constitutionally speaking, civic engagement initiative. Constitutionally speaking is a collaboration among the Rudman Center, the New Hampshire Supreme Court Society, New Hampshire Humanities, the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, the Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, and Citizens Count. At this point, I would like to introduce Maggie Goodlander, who will introduce Judge Garland and moderate tonight's event. Maggie is a Nashua native and an adjunct professor of constitutional law here at the law school. In fact, Maggie and I are co-teaching constitutional law this semester to our UNH Law Hybrid JD students. Over the past decade, Maggie has worked in each branch of the United States government and in both houses of Congress. In 2016, she graduated from Yale Law School and began her legal career as a law clerk to Judge Garland. She subsequently clerked for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Thayer, uh, Stephen Thayer, Stephen Breyer, I'm sorry, and served as counsel to the United States House of Representatives Judiciary Committee during the impeachment and, sed and Senate trial of President Trump. Maggie is a lieutenant in the United States Navy Reserve and a member of the Board of Directors of New Hampshire Legal Assistance and the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. And I'm very proud to say she is also on the uh, Rudman Center Advisory Board. Maggie? You're on mute, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, uh, for that really lovely and welcoming New Hampshire introduction. I'm, I'm really grateful to you and to the Rudman Center, to the law school, and to our fearless leader, Megan Carpenter, and of course to Martha Madden and the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, constitutionally speaking, and really for, to all of you who are out there in our digital audience tonight, um, for, for coming, coming out and, and being with us. I so wish we could be together in person uh, because I'm told that we have a really spectacular group with us tonight, a group of judges and legislators, law students, law professors, New Hampshire lawyers, and civic leaders from really all across our state. So thank you all for being with us tonight. It's, it's an honor truly to welcome you, Judge Garland, to, to uh, New Hampshire. When I think about um, the lucky breaks I've had in my life, I've had a lot, but uh, the first was being born here in New Hampshire to 
um, to a great family, and including my mom, who's out there tonight watching. Um, another lucky break was meeting my husband, Jake, at an international security conference, which is not a typical place to meet the love of your life. But most of all, uh, the chance to clerk for you, to be your law clerk, was um, really, truly the luckiest thing that has happened to me in, in the past 10 years. And, and it's a highlight of my life because I admire you so much as a person and because you've done more to shape uh, the kind of lawyer I want to be than anyone else. And so I'm so grateful that you've taken the time um, to be with us. And you're a very humble person, so I'm not going to gild the lily or overdo it in this introduction. I'm just going to actually quote the words of President Obama because I think he said it best. He, what he said was this. He said, when he was talking about Judge Garland, he said, to find someone with such a long career of public service, marked by complex and sensitive issues, someone who just about everybody not only respects, but genuinely likes, that is very rare. That is Merrick Garland. And so I'm excited to, to have the chance and honored to have the chance to ask you a couple of questions tonight, Judge Garland. Um, and I want to start, so thank you for being here. And if we were all together in person, there would be a roaring applause at this point. But here we are in this COVID era. But I'm going to jump right in. Um, I want to start by asking you, just a few weeks before I started my clerkship with you, uh, you delivered a commencement address. And it was a, a really special one because it was a commencement address to the fifth grade graduating class at J.O. Wilson Elementary School, which is a, an elementary school in Northwest Washington, DC that I got to know pretty well during my clerkship. So it was very clear to me watching you, uh, a video recording of your commencement address, uh, it was clear that these fifth graders were totally captivated by you. Uh, part of the reason I think was that you managed to, to, make, so, to speak in their language and to make references that um, resonated with them. You, you cited Beyonce, uh, Steph Curry, Taylor Swift, Albus Dumbledore, uh, and you even referenced some modern dance moves, the whip and the nene, both of which I confess I had to Google. Um, but your speech that day, I think made, it meant a lot to these students because they knew you personally. Uh, for the past 23 years, uh, including this year remotely by Zoom, uh, you have tutored second, third, fourth, and fifth graders at J.O. Wilson Elementary School in both reading and math. And I, I wanna begin by asking you how you came to volunteer in this way so many years ago. Well, I, I wanted very much to do some kind of uh, community service pro bono work um, when I became a judge. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of conflicts when you're a judge. So uh, I, I looked around for something that I thought would provide uh, direct service to the community. Um, the kids at J.L. Wilson were just slightly younger than my own kids at the time. So having worked with my kids, I figured I'd be at least barely competent in uh, math and reading issues and the writing issues. So um, started doing that. And uh, I just fell in love with it and with the kids. And uh, I really can't stop. <laughs> well, I um, you long ago, when you were just graduating from high school, you you won a scholarship, um, you started, you started, you, you went to Harvard for college. And when you started college, you wanted to be a doctor. Um, which I've always found to be kind of curious. So I wonder if you could say more about why you wanted to be a doctor and how, I mean, it's in, in a way it's connected to why you have volunteered in the way that you have for the, over the past 23 years. Um, but I'm curious if you could say more, especially I think the law students would be interested to know how you ended up moving away from medicine and into law. Uh, well, uh, yeah, they're both pretty easy. I felt then, and uh, to be honest, I uh, feel even now, uh, that uh, doctors provide uh, the clearest, most direct kind of uh, public service where you can really see uh, that what you do make a, uh, make, makes a difference uh, in, uh, in the lives of people. I think this pandemic, if anything, has made that even more clear. Um, it's really the doctors who are at the, and the, and the medical professionals and healthcare professionals, epidemiologists who are at the forefront of this particular fight. Um, so I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a form of public service and that seemed extremely gratifying. Uh, if you wanna know why I didn't become a doctor, the answer is very, also very simple, that's organic chemistry. 
Well, thank God for organic chemistry because the rule of law has benefited enormously from its existence. Um, so you, you, you put yourself through college and law school by, by doing a number of things. You worked as a tutor, you stocked shoes at, in a shoe store, and in what um, I imagine, although I'm not a comic book aficionado myself, uh, I imagine this was a very painful moment that you, you had to sell your prize comic book collection. So I wonder if you, I, I hate to bring up a, a sore subject, but could you tell sore us subject. a little bit about that? Why of all things did the comic books have to go? Yeah, well, actually, that's pretty easy. Uh, they were the only thing of monetary value I actually had. Um, and between the things you mentioned and the scholarship, I still needed more money to go to school. So, uh, um, and I had been very lucky. Um, uh, Daredevil and uh, Fantastic Four um, um, and Spider-Man uh, all came out when I was a kid. So you were able to buy those uh, early edition comics for a cover price of 12 cents. And uh, by the time I was in law school, the uh, whole bunch, which I never really thought of as a collection, it was mostly just piled in a big box, my parents' basement, uh, it was worth uh, about $1,000, which in those days was uh, went pretty far with respect to school. So it actually, it was a sad, but it was an easy decision. Well, so, you know, you juggled a lot in law school. I wonder if you if you could share one of the questions, and I should say in advance of this conversation, we got some wonderful questions from our audience. And one of the repeat questions that we got uh, was about some of the good advice, even the best advice that you've you've ever received about the law and specifically about law school. I just wonder if you could talk about advice you got, what you loved about law school, and and I suppose if there was anything you wish you'd done differently. Well, I, I, let me put this all together into one combination of things I learned and people advised me of. Um, you never know uh, what you're gonna end up being interested in the law. Uh, and uh, it's quite likely that whatever you think you're interested in when you first enter law school will not be what you're interested in by the time you're midway through your practice. So I started law school thinking I would be very interested in antitrust. I'd done work in economics and industrial or organization economics. I had a really great professor, Phil Arita, uh, worked on his treatise. And so I was pretty sure um, that that's uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, when I got into practice, uh, I, I uh, wound up doing a lot of administrative law uh, and that seemed like what I wanted to do. Uh, soon thereafter, I got a criminal antitrust case and got to see an actual criminal trial, participate in a criminal trial that progressed to uh, fraud, uh, plaintiff's fraud work that we uh, had at the firm representing the state of Maryland in its first savings and loan crisis. So I, uh, I migrated myself from uh, antitrust administrative law to criminal law and, and then, of course, back again to administrative law at the D.C. Circuit. So my advice is uh, really the uh, most important thing you can do in law school is take the black letter courses, learn the basics, be able to spot the issues regardless of what uh, you become interested in later. Uh, yes, you should take a few courses and things that seem to interest you uh, to see whether it really does or, or whether that's a door you can close. Um, so, uh, but I think between taking the uh, you know, basic law and then taking the professors. So uh, professors are much more important, I think, than the, the courses themselves. Uh, to have a good professor in a relatively small class is to develop a lifelong mentor. And I was very luck lucky to have had several of those. So that's my accumulated wisdom. Well, I wanna ask you a little bit more about administrative law. Um, and, and first, I think you'll be very pleased to know, I, I, well, as you know, I taught administrative law last, last fall. It is a required course at UNH Law School. And I think- As, as it should be everywhere. <laughs> as it should be everywhere. I think it's becoming increasingly clear though to the, the broader public um, in the United States why administrative law matters. You know, I think the Administrative Procedure Act, the heart and soul of administrative law is now, um, I think, understood more broadly, particularly in light of recent um, court decisions about the APA. But you know, at the end of the day, the APA is about a, a reasonableness requirement and a prohibition on arbitrary and capricious government uh, conduct. And so I want to ask you about 
uh, these words and this idea. Um, and in particular, about a case that you worked on um, as a law firm associate, so early in your legal career, um, the canonical case of State Farm. Uh, so can you just tell us a bit, you know, you, you worked on the case as an associate, you've written about the case uh, in, in, uh, in a law review article, and you, you now apply the case regularly as a judge. So could you tell us a bit about State Farm? Yeah, so I wish I could say that, you know, I had uh, plotted this out and planned to take this, but as with the other things I was talking about before, you just have to take the opportunities that come to you. Um, we had a, a law firm client, State Farm. They were very interested in auto safety and in, obviously in particular in reducing the cost of accidents because they were an insurance company that paid out for the cost of accidents. There was a uh, passive restraint requirement, passive restraints meaning the kind of restraint that stops you from smashing into the dashboard uh, or the windshield uh, when you're suddenly stopped without you having to do anything, two kinds of which are seat belts and uh, airbags. So the, uh, uh, there had been a passive restraint requirement which was supposed to uh, come into effect. And uh, the new administration uh, rescinded the requirement. Um, and uh, State Farm said, well, do something about it. Uh, well, when your client says that, that's, and, and that's what you wanna be doing, it's a very good thing. So um, we were able to start at the very uh, earliest level when the case was still being uh, formed in the Department of Transportation. The uh, incoming Reagan administration, which had first suspended and eventually rescinded the rule, uh, was very strong on having cost-benefit analysis. So uh, we went to a young assistant professor at Yale uh, Economics named Bill Nordhaus, who just coincidentally won the Nobel Prize in Economics two years ago, I think, and asked him to do a cost-benefit analysis. How much would it cost for the automakers to put in effect either auto automatic seat belts that automatically fitted around you or airbags um, as against the uh, costs in uh, uh, lives lost uh, uh, and work time lost of uh, accidents. And he did, and uh, it was uh, enormously on the side of uh, including saving the passive restraints. Uh, nonetheless, the uh, agency rescinded. Uh, so we, uh, 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 the first uh, and the hardest question uh, was one we had not learned or even discussed in law school, which is when is an agency action final so that you can appeal and where can you appeal it? And in those days, the first person who filed the appeal would be able to get the appeal in the circuit that they want. That's not the current method. Uh, we didn't have cell phones, but we had walkie talkies. So uh, we basically had somebody following the Secretary of Transportation around every place she went. And when she announced uh, the result in the reading room of the uh, DOT, we, uh, somebody said file. So we filed in the District of Columbia. When she issued a press uh, conference uh, the same, later the same day, file. When they entered, uh, entered the document in the reading room and sent it to the federal um, uh, register, file. Anyway, we covered our bases. Uh, we got it filed in the DC circuit. And at that point, uh, the law on what uh, arbitrary and capricious means, what you just mentioned, which is the standard of review for this kind of informal agency action um, was uh, not very well uh, developed yet. The DC Circuit had had a number of cases describing what it meant. So uh, we had the uh, great job of putting together a brief which put together the different strands of DC Circuit law, particularly emphasizing the concept of consideration of alternatives. Uh, and what the agency had done was uh, decide that automatic seatbelts uh, weren't worth it or weren't workable without really considering the question of airbags. And uh, well, this Supreme Court's opinion says a lot of things. The important part of it is that the failure to consider the reasonable alternative of airbags made the agency's decision arbitrary and capricious. Uh, this, for those who have been watching the Supreme Court over the last two years, was the centerpiece of the court's DACA opinion, uh, reaching all the way back to State Farm and the requirement of consideration of alternatives. So can you just, for one more moment, just say a bit more about how you think about what these words mean, arbitrary and capricious. So State Farm tells us that it is a requirement that government agencies have to consider alternatives, that they have to give reasons to begin with for their action, and they have to consider alternatives. You've written about the, the origins of the word capricious, and it's, but the two together, I mean, in lay terms, how do you kind of think about what that standard really means? Well, it's reasonable behavior. I mean, uh, the, this is a congressional statute. It left 
uh, some amount of room, but there's a history of what arbitrary and capricious means. And you've already reflected a number of the elements. You know, a reasonable agency making a decision would uh, explain their decision. They would consider alternatives. They would consider the factors that were relevant as set forth by the Congress. Um, all of those things, and they would uh, yield a result that was consistent with the evidence that was before the agency. In, in our case, the cost-benefit analysis, which showed uh, that the uh, benefits outweighed the costs. So um, it's a relatively light level of review. There, the question of uh, the meaning of arbitrary and capricious has gone up and down over time from what was once called hard look review to something that is, uh, I would say, a more uh, light level of review. Uh, but all in all, it's really just a question of reasonable agency behavior. So you worked on State Farm. Your, your life has really been, your career has been so focused on public service and you've, you've held, and we're going to get to um, your life on and off the bench um, in government. But I, I want to just ask you, you know, you were able to work on this case uh, from a law firm. I, how do you think about the value of your experience working in private practice? Well, I thought it was a great experience. Um, you know, you have uh, an enormous amount of resources available to uh, really uh, work a case until you're, you know, confident that you have it correct. Uh, um, and uh, you learn to write and you're very carefully um, uh, watch with respect to your writing and taught how to write well. Um, and if you're lucky enough to be in a trial practice in a firm, you get considerable training um, in that respect from people who've uh, you know, been in the courtroom. So it was, it was, a, it was quite an extremely good experience. So one of the, the real um, joys and, and, um, and benefits of being able to clerk for you was to have sort of an insider's view on how you do your job. Um, and I've heard Justice Elena Kagan explain that when she uh, was just coming to the bench for the first time and trying to figure out how to do her job, uh, she said that her approach to figuring this out was pretty simple. She walked over to your office, she sat down in your office and she grilled you for several hours about every aspect of your job so that she could implement your strategy So uh, for judging. And so I'm just, I think it'd be really interesting uh, for our audience to, to hear kind of how you organized your approach to, to judging, how you think about your job right now as a judge. Well, it's extremely generous of uh, uh, the justice. Um, I actually think there's really no trick to this. Um, and uh, with respect to uh, an appellate judge, it's actually pretty straightforward. The uh, cases come in on a certain day, that's when the briefs have to be filed. Uh, they arrive. Um, I have a law clerk assigned to a particular day, and I'm, uh, I'm of course, myself assigned to that day. And uh, the clerk reads the briefs, uh, the appendices, which is the record uh, on review, and uh, all the cases uh, cited by the uh, uh, briefs. And uh, I ask that uh, clerks read outside the box. Uh, what, what, what have the briefs failed to uh, consider? what lines of doctrine uh, maybe actually belong in the case, and, uh, and they have not considered that because they've been thinking about this and they, the, the parties, in a different way. Uh, meanwhile, I'm doing the same thing. Uh, hopefully, I have uh, read some of these cases already, and the further along I am, the more of those cases I've written, so it, that makes my life a little bit easier. Uh, but I do basically the same thing, um, and um, um, we don't do, as you know, we don't do bench memos. Uh, um, uh, we do sort of a very brief overview memo of what the case is about, but I, I like uh, working verbally and sort of batting ideas back and forth. Uh, it helps it's both work out ideas myself and uh, it helps stick in my head. Um, uh, in the old days, the uh, greatest invention to uh, keep my um, uh, muscular uh, skeletal uh, system in shape was the wheeled briefcase. Uh, but the most important uh, invention after that was the iPad, so that everything that could have been in my wheel briefcase, I can now have, hold in one hand. And I'm a, I'm a uh, confirmed uh, iPad user at this point. Well, and your iPad um, reflects the, the care that you put into and the, your attention to detail. The standing desk is also another highlight of, of, 
Oh, yes. yes, unfortunately, it doesn't work very well in um, remote uh, work. So we've been FaceTiming our line-by-line uh, -line edits of uh, the opinions. So the virtual standing desk. So the That's standing it. desk for our audience is this wonderful uh, desk that is sort of at the center of, as I remember it, it was at the center of your of your office. And it is um, punctuated by a collection of Ticonderoga pencils. <laughs> and um, it's a space for the judge to stand in, in a space where you go word for word through your opinions as you're as you're drafting them. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit about another dimension to your your approach to opinion writing, because I think it says a lot about um, the qualities that you bring to, to the judicial craft, but also your your values um, and your commitment to civility. Uh, so I, it's it's the concept of de-snarking. So I've, I've heard, uh, you know, Chief Justice John Roberts has said um, that anytime uh, one finds oneself on the opposite side, disagreeing with Judge Garland, uh, you know, you're in a very difficult position. But he's also talked about times when you have been on opposite sides of an opinion uh, and a process that you went through called de-snarking. Uh, so could you just explain uh, what is what is de-snarking and uh, why does it matter to you? Well, I'm not sure that's the technical term, but uh, it gets the point across, I'm sure. But the idea is that these sort of clever uh, negative uh, cuts that uh, uh, the judges on the other side uh, are both unnecessary and unhelpful. Uh, they uh, make uh, judges are uh, human beings and they don't like to be uh, uh, attacked in that sort of snarky way either, uh, uh, however uh, thick skinned you think we are. Uh, and that the best road to collegiality is civility. And uh, besides, this, this, this sort of snarky back and forth never looks so good a uh, year or so later uh, when you read them in the Federal Reporter. So I try to keep that out to the extent I can of uh, my opinions. And I think the example that uh, Chief Justice is referring to is one where I think we both got very, um, shall we say, active in our responding to each other. Every, every point, he had the majority, I think I had the dissent. And every uh, every uh, new uh, development that I wrote, he would respond, counter, uh, then I would counter his counter, then he would counter my counter. Uh, and, and I think we both uh, looked at it, and uh, not with respect to the arguments. The arguments were fine, uh, but the ten uh, the tenor, I thought, that was not fine. And I just walked over to his office. His office was next to mine. I said, "Look, I suggest you, you, you take a look at at my opinion. You suggest anything that you think I should uh, take out uh, in that way, and uh, uh, and I will do it." And uh, and I did. And then he said the same to me. And I did, uh, and I think that, and he did, and I think that uh, the opinion was a lot better in that respect. Um, you no, know, I also think it's important for judges, in, in order to maintain collegiality and civility, to look for areas of agreement. Uh, it is often quite possible for judges to find a core of agreement that resolves a case, uh, and uh, the remainder of the of, of decision making. Um, trying to get everything you could possibly want is unnecessary to do justice in that case. Um, I think the Chief Justice has his own phrase for that when uh, if something is unnecessary to decide, it's necessary not to decide it. Uh, and, and I agree with that. And I think uh, it's important for a lot of uh, reasons, including judicial humility, uh, but it's also very important with respect to um, collegiality uh, in the court. So part of your, your role in the DC circuit, in addition to judging, you served for seven years as the chief judge of the, of the circuit. And uh, you were involved uh, for the last three years uh, in, in an effort to overhaul the system for reporting misconduct and sexual harassment in the federal court system. So I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about that effort and the outcome. Yeah. So. Uh, as I think most people know, this all arose out of a case of a judge in the Ninth Circuit. And uh, uh, the question was, how do our, uh, uh, our judicial conduct rules deal with the issue of sexual harassment and misconduct by judges? Um, on the national level, 
we had to um, really think about the fact that our, our rules did not say that sexual misconduct was judicial misconduct or that harassment was judicial misconduct. They did not say that retaliation for reporting misconduct uh, constituted misconduct. And they importantly did not say that failure to report misconduct was itself judicial misconduct. So that if a judge knows of another judge's misconduct, it's necessary to report. So the process began um, actually with a bunch of ex-clerks, uh, former clerks who had wrote in, wrote in um, to the judicial conference saying that this has to be changed. And uh, the chief justice and the conference uh, quite agreeing. Uh, at that point, I was serving on the executive committee for the conference. And so we thought about the task of rewriting our judicial conduct rules for the country and rewriting uh, the uh, um, conduct and disability rules, which have to do with punishment of, uh, of judges. Uh, but this is not good enough on the, to just say this on the national level, as you can imagine, to uh, prevent misconduct. Uh, this has to be done at the more granular level, has to be done at the level of each circuit and each district court. So in our, uh, working together with our dis chief district judge, um, we worked on a series of uh, uh, ways in which to prevent this uh, from happening. And this included um, creating a number of different uh, ways in which people could, uh, not only law clerks, but also other uh, uh, members of the staff could report misconduct. Some people um, want to maintain a high level of their own confidentiality. They are afraid and for good reason that if their name get a, gets attached to a misconduct complaint that could hurt them in the future. The judges have to, to you know, think about the power relationship here, which is enormous and dangerous. And uh, so we developed series of different routes by which uh, people could complain to uh, peer groups that we established to a uh, committee of former clerks that we established for this purpose. Uh, we established our uh, circuit mediators who are outside of the chain of command uh, of the circuit um, uh, to, to uh, be another, another way. So we uh, developed a series of, of ways. We developed a series of confidentiality rules which would allow people who uh, were, uh, thought they were, um, or maybe even weren't sure whether or what was happening to them uh, was harassment, uh, who they could consult with uh, at various levels of different kinds of confidentiality. We uh, created uh, training sessions, uh, including mandatory training sessions at the beginning of every year for all employees uh, to explain what uh, misconduct was or workplace misconduct was and how seriously as a circuit and as a district uh, uh, we took these things. And then we developed a maybe you might call it a dashboard, but on our website, a series of a flow chart, which explains all the different ways that any employee can report. Uh, on the national level, we also created an office of judicial integrity uh, where uh, there could be both anonymous and non-anonymous reporting on a national level if you wanted to go outside of the bounds of the, of the circuit. So I, I, you know, I think these are very important things. Uh, each one of them though is only a step and uh, all of them together are only a step. And uh, this is going to require uh, probably a lifetime commitment by the judiciary to ensure uh, that we, we protect our employees. So I want to shift gears a little bit um, and ask you, because, you know, your service to our country goes well beyond the 23 years that you've spent on the bench, and it includes your service at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, and where you've worked on really some of the most complicated and significant cases that the department has ever faced. And I want to ask you about uh, two of those in, in particular. But before I do, uh, you actually started your post-clerkship career in the law uh, at, the, at the Department of Justice. In 1979, you served as a special assistant to the Attorney General of the United States. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that job entailed and what you learned. Yes, well, um, in the words of uh, Aaron Burr, uh, it was uh, being in the room where it happened. Um, but uh, you don't actually get to do anything about uh, uh, what happened, except give uh, sort of uh, peanut gallery advice. Uh, and the time I was there, uh, three very exciting things among happened, and one hugely important thing. Uh, and three movies were made of events occurring during the time I was there. Unfortunately, uh, nobody played a little special assistant in the corner. 
so one was Argo, uh, starring uh, Ben Affleck, about the takeover of the American embassy in Iran and the exfiltration of the uh, American diplomats through the Canadian embassy to the United States. Uh, um, uh, one was American Hustle, uh, which starred Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper, uh, involving a case, famous case called Abscam, which involved uh, uh, undercover uh, investigation of uh, uh, attempts to bribe uh, members of Congress uh, for uh, private immigration bills. And the last, and the one I liked the, the best, was um, the uh, Olympics in uh, 19, Winter Olympics in 1980 in uh, Lake Placid. We were very worried about a replay of what had happened in uh, Munich, uh, uh, Black September uh, terrorist attack. Um, and um, so one thing I did do is go up to Lake Placid to look over what was being done with respect to the, to the uh, protection against terrorism. Fortunately, there was no terrorism in the end. And the movie that came out, which was a Miracle on Ice, about the miraculous uh, victory of the yeah, amateur American hockey team against the uh, Russian professionals. Uh, the other thing, of course, that was uh, hugely important was this was the post-Watergate uh, period. Um, the, um, there had been, as uh, uh, people who listen to podcasts now know, uh, quite a, uh, a number of scandals in the uh, Justice Department during related to Watergate. Uh, Attorney General Mitchell was convicted of uh, participating in the uh, planning and the, and the cover-up. Attorney General Kleindienst was uh, convicted uh, with respect to his uh, testimony about whether the president directed him to drop an antitrust case. Uh, and of course, uh, Archibald Cox uh, was fired, a uh, special prosecutor, and uh, Elliot Richardson resigned, and then uh, Bill Ruckelshaus resigned as uh, attorneys general. Uh, so it was a, uh, it was a, uh, amazing uh, time in that respect. Um, the next three attorneys general, beginning with Ed Levy, who, uh, who uh, served under um, President Ford, followed by Judge Bell and Ben Civiletti under um, Car uh, President Carter, uh, really thought, uh, focused enormously on um, creating a set of uh, standards and policies that would create norms for the department. Uh, that uh, that the, the department would be uh, kept separate from politics, that the White House would not contact uh, ind uh, individual prosecutors and supervisors. They would be insulated in criminal criminal cases, uh, that there would be very clear uh, uh, lines uh, with respect to the White House not uh, having any kind of direction of uh, political uh, investigations. Uh, there was established a public integrity uh, section, which still remains uh, to do uh, uh, political uh, corruption cases nationally. Uh, there was a, a series of um, guidelines put in place for the operation of the FBI and use of different kinds of intrusive techniques, which uh, the department had employed um, uh, in some uh, political cases, but also in case against protesters which at the time meant uh, Vietnam War protesters and against civil rights leaders like um, uh, Dr. King. Um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, had just been passed uh, and the uh, department established a uh, series of regulations on uh, what kind of surveillance was permissible and what was required for permissible of all foreign agents in the United States. Uh, memorandum were established a uh, liberal reading of the Freedom of Information Act to encourage the department and the agencies to produce uh, documents. Um, so uh, there, there was an enormous uh, and very fertile period of the development of uh, norms uh, to protect the independence of the department. So, uh, you know, there is, yeah, I think of it as sort of a constellation of post-Watergate uh, statutes, but at, at bottom, as you just as you just said a second ago, it's really about um, norms. I mean, the, the guardrails are really commitments to the independence of the department. And I, I, um, I, I remember asking Justice Kagan once about uh, her. She, she, you worked together in in the Clinton administration, but you were at the Department of Justice, and she was at the White House. And 
She said she loved working with you, but sometimes it was a little annoying because you didn't always do what the White House asked you to do. Uh, but the reason for that, as you say, is, is can you just say a little bit more about what, what was set out? These were memoranda that were written by attorneys general, basically articulating a commitment to the independence of the department. Um, and then- Yeah, so just to be clear about uh, Justice Kagan, um, she was not in the criminal area. So uh, what she was talking about is uh, uh, policies of the department, which are as a general matter, are certainly permissible for uh, the White House to communicate with the department. Um, but there were some that the um, uh, department thought were ones we did not want to adopt, and we made that clear to, to, the, to the White House, yeah, again, in a collegial and civil way. Um, but um, uh, yeah, the, but the norms that we're talking about here are the independence of the department from political influence, um, and uh, particularly political influence in the uh, criminal and uh, 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 in, in the criminal area. So that, that that's what these kind of memorandum were about. They were for the purpose of insulating the department uh, in those respects. Um, uh, and also in the civil respect, if, if, if what the White House wanted the department to do was for a political rather than for a legal reason, uh, that the department wouldn't do it and uh, would make clear um, that uh, they were not expected to do it. So one of the other roles you played um, where you weren't just in the room where it happened, you were making it happen was uh, 10 years after you started at the department, you returned um, in 1989, a decade after that initial job, um, you joined the US Attorney's Office in Washington DC as a line prosecutor. And there's a lot, of, I wanna ask you a few questions about this, this, um, about this experience you had, but the first question I want to ask you is how you got the job, because um, the New Hampshire bar is a very collegial bar. It's a, you know, we're proud members of the bar. It's a, it's a mandatory bar, but it's a small bar. And you, you know, you, you never know who you're going to, how you're going to interact with people who are on opposite sides of the case that you're arguing in the future. And so this story to me is, is illustrative of how you've approached um, collegiality as, an, as, a, as a prosecutor and as a practicing lawyer. Okay, well, that's a fair question. But the, the lead up here is that I was involved in a trial for the state of Maryland when I was in private practice against um, uh, officers and directors of a bank who had defrauded the bank. And the trial judge had been both a federal prosecutor and a federal public defender. This was in state court. And after I did a cross-examination of uh, the bank's uh, COO, uh, there was a break and he called me into his chambers. And as you can imagine, being called into a judge's chambers is kind of uh, more than slightly scary. And I was sure I had overstepped some bound that I did not know. Uh, but instead he said, look, uh, you're wasting your time. You shouldn't be uh, working, you're wasting your life actually is what he said. You shouldn't be working in a private firm. <laughs> Uh, you should go to the U.S. Attorney's office. And I uh, said, very kind of you, but I've got a job to do and I'm doing my job. Um, three weeks later, uh, in a stroke of what can only be described as kismet, uh, uh, a, a person who I had been on the opposite side of in a totally different case, uh, became the U.S. Attorney uh, uh, for the District of Columbia. And uh, we had been opponents in the case, but collegial and civil. And uh, he called me and said, I'm going to be the U.S. Attorney. I'm developing a complex crimes unit, and I'd like you to come over. So uh, with some consternation uh, from my, um, my uh, partners at the law firm um, and some disbelief from some of the partners, uh, I left and uh, went to the U.S. Attorney's office. Yeah. So you gave, up, um, you gave up an office with windows for an office without windows, mm -hmm. and a, an office that I think you've said sometimes smelled a little bit like stale cigarettes. Uh, but the upside was that you took on a role as a federal prosecutor, a role that, you know, reminded me of the words that uh, Justice Robert Jackson used to describe the power of a prosecutor when just, bef just after he, he became uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's Attorney General, he said that the federal prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. Um, but, you know, the prosec prosecutors, and I want to ask you about one of the first cases that you worked on, or maybe even the first case you worked on as a prosecutor, because the role is also a role that is central to 
the way that um, the faith that Americans have in our government and in our system of justice. And I, oh, and, and I wonder if you could talk about that first case and how you have approached um, victims of crime and the, 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 issue, the question of, of, of faith in the system and how to, how to, how to, how to keep it. Uh, well, I'll start with the cigarettes. Um, it wasn't just the smell, it was actually the stubs of the cigarettes were all inside, inside the uh, desk. The uh, office had been the waiting room for witnesses. I think this was part of the hazing uh, ceremony for the new guy. Um, so that, that was my office uh, at the very start. Uh, look, this was uh, 1989. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll back up on, on, on the Jackson question. Of course, uh, you are exactly right. Uh, the, the prosecutor has enormous uh, power to do uh, good, um, but also uh, enormous power uh, to avoid bad. Uh, so a prosecutor should never bring a case that uh, he or she doesn't think uh, involves a guilty person uh, and guilty of the crime that you're actually charging. Uh, you always have to realize that even if, uh, you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna leave it to the jury because if a case is dropped or somebody is acquitted, that follows them the rest of their life, uh, uh, no matter. And as everyone uh, who's paying attention knows, it means very difficult to get a job and they're for very difficult uh, to sustain yourself and or family and society. So the prosecutor has enormous uh, responsibility to be uh, doing the right thing. And individual prosecutors generally have the discretion which enables them to do that. Um, and so it's very important that people of integrity become uh, our prosecutors, um, not only uh, to do good, but to make sure uh, that other people don't do bad. Um, uh, now to get to 1989, which is, uh, uh, sounds like a, um, a Taylor Swift song. Um, um, it was a very bad time in the District of Columbia. There were, um, about uh, 460 murders that year. Uh, there were 160 last year, which gives you a, a sense of the difference. There was a huge turf war going on among uh, uh, gangs who were selling crack. And in this particular case, a gang from New York had uh, come down to Washington, uh, taken over a uh, public housing project, uh, which was, uh, as they called them in those days, uh, Mayfair Mansions, which you can imagine that's not what it was. Uh, they they uh, they went into the uh, the uh, apartments of mothers and grandmothers who were taking care of children and grandchildren and threatened to kill them if they didn't uh, allow them to uh, you know cook crack uh, package and distribute it out of their uh, out of those apartments uh, uh, and uh, there was a lot of violence involved with this uh, particular gang. And uh, uh, there were a series of arrests by the police uh, uh, in which they finally figured out that it was a gang and not individual uh, violence at, at various street corners. And um, uh, you know, we had to, the only way we could make the case was to go to the, uh, the victims um, and tell them uh, uh, that we would protect them, which is uh, uh, and the only way we're gonna protect them was by, by um, convicting uh, these people. Um, and, and, and they trusted us uh, to make their community safe. And in the end, we did succeed in, in convicting them under the uh, uh, Kingpin statute. Uh, so uh, this is my first uh, real direct involvement with victims of crime in the District of Columbia. So six years after that, you uh, were back in the Department of Justice, but this time at Maine Justice and serving in the a role that involved um, being really at the helm of the uh, the aftermath of the worst domestic uh, act of de domestic terrorism uh, that the United States of America had ever seen. Uh, so this was in April of 1995, and uh, the Oklahoma City bombing happened on the morning uh, of of April 19th, and uh, you know. A number, I'm sure, of law students who are, who are listening may not have a, a recollection of, of what happened that day. Uh, the, you know, the basic facts are that uh, two men, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, drove uh, a truck that was packed with explosives into the federal building in Oklahoma City, uh, into uh, 
a building that uh, where you know hundreds of people, I think 500 people worked uh, from various par parts of the U.S. government. Um, 168 people were killed, including 19 children um, who were in the building's daycare center at the time of the blast. Uh, so you've called your work on that case, which was really considerable, the most important thing uh, you've ever you've ever done in your life. And I, I wonder if you could be, begin by just walking us through what happened in the first 24 hours after this devastating attack. What you saw from the Department of Justice and, and how you became involved. Yeah, so uh, in that role, I was a principal deputy to the deputy attorney general and uh, therefore had considerable contact with the U.S. attorney's offices around the country and uh, with the FBI. Um, I was sitting at my desk. I get an email um, from the U.S. attorney's office in Oklahoma City saying that a gas explosion has occurred at the federal building. Uh, and they're going over to investigate. Um, and uh, I turn on the television. In those days, there was one and only one 24-7 um, um, news station, that was CNN. Uh, and there was nothing going on on CNN, so I figured it was a gas explosion. Uh, about 10, 15 minutes later, uh, I get a report, it's not a gas explosion, it was a bombing and it was terribly devastating. And just about that time, uh, it starts uh, showing up on CNN. And uh, um, uh, the other um, uh, prosecutors and, uh, and uh, Justice Department folks I was working with all crowd into the office and we're all watching. And you know, our first first uh, fear is that it was something like the bombing of the Marine barracks in Lebanon because it looked very similar. I had, I mean, a third of the building had uh, it was completely missing. It it, it, it pancaked into the ground. Um, so um, that's uh, that's what happened. Uh, first thing, I go up to the deputy attorney general to let her know what happened, and we both go to the attorney general to let her know what happened. Uh, we start talking about, uh, we set up a command center at uh, the FBI, uh, another command center uh, in, in Washington, another command center was set up in um, Oklahoma City. Um, we caught an extremely lucky break over the first 24 hours. Um, the, the axle of the rider truck in which the 2,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate had been placed uh, was blown about uh, two or three blocks away from the building, landed on a car just as people got out of the car. Fortunate for them that they had gotten out of the car, fortunate for us because it drew everybody's attention to the axle. Uh, the axles of car, uh, most parts of cars have what are called uh, VIN numbers, uh, vehicle identification numbers, so the invent of car theft, um, it's possible to trace. Here, the FBI was able to trace the um, the VIN number to uh, a Ford manufacturer in, in uh, Florida, to a sale to ride a truck in Florida, uh, to a uh, movement of the truck to Junction City, Kansas, where it was rented to a man by the name of Kling. Um, and um, uh, uh, the FBI um, sent in a, um, uh, a sketch artist who uh, drew a picture of what Mr. Kling looked like, started showing it around in concentric circles around the rider truck place. Sure enough, at a place, uh, um, uh, at, at a, uh, a motel, um, uh, they showed it uh, to the proprietor who said, uh, uh, that's Mr. McVeigh and he's in room X, or he was in room X. McVeigh, not Kling, no, definitely McVeigh. So the FBI went to the room, and in those days, the way you uh, checked telephone calls was by uh, you know, calling into the operator and asking uh, them to check what numbers had been called from that room. Sure enough, Mr. McVeigh had called a Chinese restaurant for takeout and left an order in the name of Kling. So we were pretty sure that this was our guy. Um, and... Um, um, so at this point, there were uh, sightings of Mr. McVeigh all across the country because the, uh, the, the sketch art uh, had been put out on, on, on the TV. And uh, there were bomb threats uh, in courthouses and other buildings all across the country. Um, and it was clear we we're going to need a national um, sort of center for uh, doing this. The U.S. attorney in Oklahoma City had just become 
a federal judge. The acting U.S. attorney was a civil attorney. Uh, actually, fortunately, I was uh, uh, in the room where it happened uh, when the U.S. attorney, acting U.S. attorney, called uh, Attorney General Reno and said, "You have to send somebody." Uh, and again, as luck, you know, experience, and fate would have it, having had a, a lot of experience with violent crime cases, I was the only one in the room who did, and I was uh, sent to Oklahoma City. So part of the, when you arrived in Oklahoma City, I want to ask you about um, how you, what happened when you first arrived, but, but more broadly, you know, you're dealing with a high stakes, complex investigation that is moving very quickly, um, that is, you know, a whole bunch of sensitive lines of, of, of this investigation at the same time that the nation, although there's only one 24 seven news source is, is gripped by um, fear and a desire to know more. So you've written as a judge about the importance of transparency in government. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk about how you thought about transparency as a prosecutor. Uh, yeah, so I mean, and just in terms of the timeline, uh, you know, I say goodbye to wife and my wife and my two little kids and uh, take an FBI plane from uh, that point from Manassas. Uh, there was no plane and FBI didn't have the jet in the um, pre 9-11 period. So uh, we had to land in Indianapolis uh, where somebody came to, uh, to, the, to the plane with what was then called a cell phone, which is the size of a brick. And uh, it turned out that Mr. McVeigh had been uh, arrested about 90 minutes, 90 miles away, a 60 mile an hour uh, road um, uh, going north by a, uh, a, a state trooper by the name of Charlie Hanger. You literally can't make this stuff up. He was in the Noble County Jail. He was about to be released on bond, on personal recognizance bond. But he had been arrested because he had an unregistered uh, handgun. And he had, had a, he had stopped because he had a car that didn't have a license plate, which he had taken off to avoid being ticketed um, when he left the getaway car. So he was arrested. He was brought uh, to Oklahoma City. Uh, the courthouse had been damaged, so he was going to be, uh, or the first presentment was going to be in Tinker Air Force Base. So I, I get off the plane. It's dark. Uh, FBI meets us. I drive to, we drive to uh, Tinker where I'm going to do the uh, presentment in front of the magistrate judge. There is a crowd of people outside. Uh, we were very afraid that somebody would try to assassinate uh, McVeigh. And they're all shouting and screaming. Anyway, it turned out they were the press. They were not a pitchfork mob. The uh, Air Force Base, like any Air Force Base, kept everybody out. And uh, they, they wanted in. So I get inside. And I see there's an empty JAG courtroom that they're using. And uh, they were not planning on allowing any uh, spectators. And I said, well, we're not going to have the first uh, presentment in a case involving a possible conspiracy that it be a conspiracy in which the press is kept out. So I, you know, there was a back and forth. The FBI was on my side. They had a uh, back and forth with the uh, MPs. Eventually, the MPs gave in. They went outside and filled the courtroom. And so we had our first presentment. But I thought it very important that we do have that. And thereafter, we had a press conference every day uh, explaining what we were doing, why we were doing it. Um, eventually, we got to the stage of grand jury, in which case, of course, we couldn't disclose anything. But uh, before that, we were trying to let people know what we were doing and why, why, why we were doing it. So Judge, it's six o'clock, but if you would, if you'd be willing, I was hoping to just ask you three more questions. If, if you can ask me as many questions as you want, Meg. Well, this is a rare opportunity. So I, <laughs> I, I do want to ask you about, you know, this year is the 25th anniversary of, of the Oklahoma City bombing. You were there after this, um, this the arraignment at Tinker Air Force Base. You went to the site of the federal building. You were there, you know, while the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building was still in flames, but you stayed in Oklahoma City for a number of weeks after the attack, and you described as I, I want. I wonder if you could speak about what you saw um, from the people of Oklahoma City in 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 the aftermath of this attack. The spirit of generosity that they brought to each other and uh, to your investigation and your efforts. You've called you. you 
you cited what the people of Oklahoma have called the Oklahoma, the Oklahoma standard. So could you tell us a little bit about the people of Oklahoma City, uh, the community more broadly, and, and how you went about engaging them as, as well as, you know, in particular, the, the um, victims' families and the survivors of, of the attack? Yeah, sure. So a a immediately after the presentment where McVeigh was held over, um, I asked to be driven to the bomb site. Um, it was like a battleground. Uh, 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 about eight square blocks of the city had been damaged by the enormously powerful uh, 2,000 pound bomb, which broke windows and knocked out bricks a lot of places. Uh, and it was guarded by Humvees uh, with National Guard. People did not know whether this was the beginning of some kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of attack uh, by some kind of domestic terrorist or foreign terrorist group. Uh, it, uh, the building was, a third of the building had been destroyed. Uh, uh, you know, they, Part that was destroyed was the uh, was uh, the citizen the children's center, which was uh, glass windows, uh, you know, facing uh, the area where uh, the bomb went off. So most most not all of those children died there. The explosion was enormous. The parking lot across was uh, uh, still the cars were still smoldering, um, and all the way on the other end of the parking lot, a uh, the, the roof of the building um, across the street had been uh, lifted up and smacked back down. So it was very uh, a tough um, uh, situation, and uh, the FBI had established a command center in an old um, uh, southwestern Bell um, building uh, just outside the uh, marked off zone. And so I go there next, and it is amazing. The first floor is uh, all rescue workers. Um, Salvation Army had set up a uh, food line um, and um, uh, the rescue workers uh, um, you know, were 24 seven digging for bodies. The second floor was uh, all the agencies of the government um, uh, as well as the state, the federal government as well as the state government uh, who were participating in the investigation because of the quite a large number of federal agencies whose uh, members had died in the, in, in the bombing. Um, and I stayed there. I ended up staying there on and off for about two months, actually. And um, what you describe is correct about the citizens of Oklahoma. Everybody uh, was unbelievably uh, solicitous and, and uh, cooperative with the outsiders who came in. Uh, the, the, uh, the rescue workers came from, again, you know, I'm from uh, Bethesda Chevy Chase. There was a famous rescue squad in Bethesda Chevy Chase. <laughs> They had driven across the country to be there. And um, the um, uh, people would come in and uh, there'd be signs that say, you know, leave your laundry or uh, we'll clean it and return it to you. <laughs> um, people came in, offered to do haircuts before press conferences, which is a little bit like. Uh, what goes on now in remote. This is my wife's haircut that you're looking at right here. Um, and um, uh, everybody cooperated. I met with the, uh, the governor, uh, you know, the president uh, was uh, President Clinton, who was a Democrat. The attorney general was Jan Reno. I met with the governor of Oklahoma, who was a Republican. I met with the DA, who was a Democrat. I met with the, you know, the head of the state police. I have no idea if he had any affiliation. And nobody cared. Um, Everybody um, completely cooperated. Uh, we met uh, repeatedly with uh, 168 people or so died. Many, many more were injured and many, many more were uh, seriously uh, psychologically hurt by the uh, fact that members of their family and closest friends were hurt. So we spent a lot of time meeting with uh, uh, victims and survivors. Uh, we all gathered together actually on the roof of a, of a building about six weeks later when, the, when we finally imploded the Murrah building because it was just getting too dangerous to uh, work in and there was uh, uh, no one else to rescue and nothing more necessary from a forensic uh, point of view. Um, and um, they have a spectacular museum of the uh, bombing in Oklahoma City 
they do have this motto of the Oklahoma way of taking care of each other. And, you know, one of the saddest parts, you know, many sad parts of the pandemic is I was not able to travel to Oklahoma City for the anniversary, which I had planned uh, on being there for. Um, so I do, I do feel like it, uh, you know, we promised the victims we would find the people who did it. Well, I'm sure you will be back in Oklahoma City. And I, I uh, you worked on one other very high profile bombing case the, the, the next year, the year after, um, in 1996, you worked on um, the prosecution of Ted Kaczynski, the, the so-called Unabomber. And I want to ask you about a, a moment of, of pretty high drama in the case. You faced a number of really tough decisions, um, but one of them uh, was the decision surrounding the raid on Mr. Kaczynski's Montana cabin, which happened on uh, April 3rd, 1996. So can you just describe what happened that night and what what was what were some of the decisions you faced? Uh, well, um, so I, I wound up on this case because the Unabomber got jealous of McVeigh. And while we were in Oklahoma City, he threatened to uh, blow up uh, Los Angeles Airport um, uh, and then actually did send a bomb to uh, a corporate executive in Sacramento. Uh, so uh, when I got back to, to Washington and just, super, just supervising from a distance of Oklahoma City, I picked up uh, the Unabomber case also, which had been dormant um, because he had not done anything. And again, he had, he had done quite a number of bombings since the 70s, um, the 80s, uh, but he hadn't done any in a while, but it looked like he was going to start doing them again. Uh, really all leads were cold. Um, and uh, then he sends this uh, um, manifesto to the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, which says, I'm the Unabomber, this is my explanation. It's an extremely, you could say, idiosyncratic uh, uh, piece. Uh, closest analogy would be the Luddites of the 19th century, uh, you know, who want to destroy all machines because of technology. He wanted to also destroy all modern technology. And um, uh, you know, the, the uh, publishers for the Post and the Times uh, came in. Normally, uh, they would not ask what we thought about publication. And normally, the uh, Justice Department and the FBI would say, no, please don't publish, don't publish, because it'll only uh, get the person going to do more and create copycats. But this was a pretty unique situation. Um, uh, we were at a complete loss. The, the uh, profiles had all failed. Uh, he was being profiled as a uh, Southern uh, California airplane mechanic because of one of the bombings. Uh, when in fact, of course, he actually came from a Chicago suburb, studied at Harvard and uh, Michigan, and uh, was living in uh, Montana. Um, there is a there's a pretty good um, uh, movie out on I think Netflix now called Manhunt. Um, parts of it are you know about the personal life of the uh, of the profile who actually did. Um, uh, um, help resolve the case, not the earlier ones. But, um, uh, but basically, they, um, uh, they published, we, they, you know, they said, we're not asking your permission, but what do you think? And we said, well, we think you should publish because it's the only way we're going to find anything. And, and we were hoping somebody would recognize his idiosyncratic writing. And sure enough, relatively short order, somebody calls in. Of course, we had lots of calls, uh, people thinking you know, they know the Unabomber, including friends of mine who claim that it's one of our classmates from high school, uh, which it was not. <laughs> but um, turned out to be the brother, um, Kaczynski's brother, who did recognize it, who did have lots of letters from Kaczynski, whose letters matched up pretty well uh, in terms of a linguistic analysis and an, um, sort of an early form of uh, computer analysis that we now use for, that you use now for plagiarism of, uh, of law school papers we were using to compare uh, language. Anyway, there, there was the question of the, of the, uh, of the search warrant. Uh, no one had, uh, we'd never had a search warrant before based on really this kind of linguistic comparison. I approved the warrant um, and uh, the judge in Montana uh, approved the warrant and uh, uh, that morning, I think, at least, um, but we had previously, we, we had identified where he was and uh, sent out agents and a, uh, and a prosecutor. Um, um, and the plan was they would go in that night. Uh, that night happened to be Passover. And uh, 
We have a traditional uh, Seder at our house, uh, and part of the tradition is to invite uh, a stranger to the uh, Seder, and I had invited Janet Reno uh, to, the, to our Seder, and uh, about halfway through the Seder, uh, Louis Free, who was the FBI director, calls and says they're in, uh, they've, uh, they have him safely, and um, there's look like there's bomb making material, can we charge him with being the Unabomber? So uh, Attorney General Reno and I repair to uh, the attic, which was my uh, office. And uh, we say, well, you know, you, why don't you charge him with bomb making materials? We'll worry about the rest later. He said, all right. 10 minutes later, he calls back again. And he says, um, uh, we look like we have sort of a partially developed bomb here. He said, can we charge him with being a Unabomber? Charge him with bomb making materials? Calls back 10 minutes later, he said, we have a carbon copy of the manifesto and a diary describing each bombing and how we did it. Um, at which point we said, <laughs> you can charge him with whatever you want. <laughs> 10 minutes after that, uh, the prosecutor I sent out calls and said, there was, we've all just been um, chased out of the cabin. There was a live bomb under his uh, bed. So it was a very a dramatic, a very scary, uh, but fortunately, in the end, uh, uh, safely executed search. Well, Judge, there's there. Um, we've now talked about several movies and television shows <laughs> that you made about your, your the life and times of. None of them have me, and I thought, oh, you know, so I'm still holding out. <laughs> That's for the next one. Um, <laughs> I I want to end by uh, by just asking you. You know, today is. Uh, the 244 years ago today, so September 9th, 1776, the Continental Congress formally declared that the name of our new nation would be the United States. And we don't, you know, we don't, so we, because of the grandeur of July 4th, we, this day, September 9th, is, is a little bit more forgotten in American history, but it's, it's significant uh, for a lot of reasons, but I want to, I want, I want to ask you about how you came to, uh, to be an American and why you've, you've decided to devote your career to serving our country. You know, it's Oklahoma City and the way in which both the community there and, um, you know, elected officials and government officials across the country came together, were united in addressing this, this um, devastating attack is a reminder just of you know, the difficulties we face today, the polarization today, the division today. But what's beautiful about our country is that our name is also a reminder of the promise and the mission statement. And one, one thing we have in common is that our, our grandparents, my, grand, my grandparents like yours came to this country uh, in the early 1900s. Your, your grandparents were fleeing anti-Semitism and they came here with the hope of making a better life in America. And I, I wonder if you could, you, we could close, I want to invite you to, to share, if you would, what, what do you think your grandparents loved about America and why you've devoted your, your career to serving our country? Yeah, this is going to make me choke up. <laughs> You're going to have to live with that. Uh, look, my um, grandparents uh, uh, knew that they owed their lives <laughs> to, uh, the willingness of America to take them in. Uh, and the same is true for me. Uh, it's not just that I might otherwise be living in Belarus. It's that I wouldn't be living at all. Um, my grandmother uh, was one of five children. Three of them came to the United, made it to the United States. One of them tried, but was turned back at Ellis Island. And one didn't try. Those two died in the Holocaust. <laughs> so there was little doubt that uh, the same would have happened to my grandmother. Um, so I think at, at bottom, uh, the reason that, uh, that I and uh, my siblings and uh, my parents uh, tried to do as much public service and as um, uh, much uh, community service as we could uh, was to pay the back, country back uh, for the sanctuary that, that it provided to my family. We are, we are lucky, Judge Garland, for your service to our country. And I am 
I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to be with us tonight. And um, I, I just, I could, I could go on for hours. <laughs> well, this will be the next. I'm no Ken Burns. I can't. <laughs> But I, I do have, I think I have a documentary in me one day. Um, so thank you for, for, for taking the time this evening. And I want to turn it back to uh, my friend and colleague, John Grebe, and, and just thank, thank uh, UNH Law School and Martha Masden and John Grebe and the, the whole community of people who brought us together today uh, once again for having us. And um, thank you all. And to all who are still listening, the 200 plus of you. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. And, and thank you so much, uh, Judge Garland, uh, for your generosity in, in joining uh, us tonight and sharing, uh, and sharing uh, some of your story with us. We, 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 we really deeply appreciate it. Um, uh, thanks to everybody. Um, as Maggie just said, there's over 200 people still here with us. Uh, thanks to all of you who've joined us uh, for tonight's event. Uh, please know that the TREAT Lecture Series continues this fall uh, with four more free events co-sponsored by the Redden Center and the uh, New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education. On September 17th, we will celebrate Constitution Day with an event titled Meeting the Moment, uh, Renewing Democracy Through Civic Learning. On September 24th, we will present Why is Civic Education Essential to Our National Security? Um, on October 1st, we'll present Protect and Defend the Constitution, the Significance of the Oath of Office. Uh, and on October 29th, we will present Is Civic Learning a Constitutional Right? Uh, and for more information, including times, speakers, speaker biographies, and various registration links, uh, please visit the New Hampshire Civics website at www.nhcivics.org. Megan, I see that you've come back. Would you like to just say good night to everybody? <laughs> thank you so much, Judge Garland. Thank you to Maggie. Um, and thank you, John. Have a wonderful night, everyone, and look forward to more events soon. Thank you. Thank you.